Today on the show, we're joined by Nikki Shearer, who oversees all copywriting and language for churchwide initiatives at Elevation Church. This means Nikki is responsible for what Elevation says and how they say it. Now, you might be familiar with uh, a church style guide for things like, this is our logo, and this is the color we use, and this is the font that we use. Essentially, what Nikki oversees is a language style guide. Which is probably not something your church has, but might be what you need. Especially because the words that we use in person and online do matter a lot more than our logo. So, let's dive in. Well, hey there, and welcome to the Pro Church Tool Show. We're here to help you and your church navigate the biggest communication shift in 500 years. I'm Brady Shearer, your host. I'm joined as always by my co-host, it's Alexander Mills. Hello, hello. And today we're also joined by Nikki Shearer of Elevation Church. Uh, Nikki oversees copywriting and language for all of Elevation churchwide initiatives. Uh, prior to that, Nikki was involved in Elevation social media for about three years, in children's ministry for a few years before that, and her husband is also uh, a campus pastor at one of Elevation's locations. Nikki, welcome to the show. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. I feel like one of the first things that we should tackle is our shared last name. Mm -hmm. No, we are not related, <laughs> but surely, Nikki, you know the pain uniquely that I feel when people try to pronounce our last name. It's not easy to add the E-R to Sheer. No. It just gets shortened. Brady Sheer. Well, er, Sheer. <laughs> it's very challenging. It uh, is. Nikki, I know one of the things that you oversee at Elevation is what you described as Elevation Church Voice. And I think that's where I'd like to start our conversation. Mm -hmm. What exactly is Elevation Church Voice? Well, um, it's the way that we speak, um, and and as a as a church grows, uh, the number of people communicating on behalf of that church grows as well, and and then there can become a lot of variety in the way that we see things and all of that, and and so when I speak of Elevation Church voice, um, it's a distinction because. We also have uh, Pastor Stephen Furtick's voice, and we have the voice of, of our Pastor Holly Furtick and the voice of our children's ministry, right? All these different things. And so when we talk about a collective voice, like Elevation Church voice, as opposed to an individual voice, like Pastor Stephen Furtick's voice, it's really different, right? Because a collective voice shouldn't sound like one person. It should sound like a group of people in a, in essence. And so I describe when I teach it, um, Elevation Church Voice is uh, casual, concise, and conversational. And 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 we developed that because um, our church is a global church. Uh, we have a lot of locations, but our ministry is worldwide. And and when you can and when you can give it parameters like that, um, that means that we can have Elevation Church Voice in English or Spanish. Um, we can have a Elevation Church Voice in the United States or somewhere in Europe, and um, because casual is casual in whatever language or place that you're speaking it, for instance. Uh, you answered one of the first questions that I wanted to ask, which was, how do you differentiate between Pastor Stephen's voice and Elevation's voice? Are Would you say that Obviously, the difference exists. Is the Elevation kind of brand voice inspired by Pastor Stephen? And the reason I ask is because, like, my exposure to Elevation is so much influenced by, like, what I see on my social feed, which is mostly going to be, you know, sermon clips and things like that from Pastor Stephen. So are there carryovers or are they completely distinct? Um, there are some carryovers, but they're actually pretty distinct. Pastor Stephen's voice is really direct. Um, a lot of a lot of the quotes, the things that people love that he says, um, they're very unique to him, and and he gets straight to the point. Um, he doesn't, he's not very um, like soft in his approach. Whereas as a church, sometimes we want to be. Um, and so uh, when the difference between if you look at Pastor Stephen's social media and the church's social media, they might show you the same sermon moment, for instance. But Pastor Stephen's social media is going to show you that sermon moment. And, and the caption is going to be direct. It's going to be clear. It's probably going to be really short. But the church's, uh, the lens that we give it is going to, there's going to be more of a lens to it. So we're going to talk more about like, what does this mean for your life? And, and how you can you apply that? And, and so it's just taking more of that like active approach to, to really like help people take it to another level. Okay, so I guess my big question then would be, what's the value in keeping them, di them different? I, I would expect, I think, oh, it would be good if the voices were closer to the same. Uh, what's the value for keeping them separate? Uh, oh, gosh, there's several. Um, they have different audiences, first thing. Um, Pastor Steven, there are a lot of people who follow him who don't follow Elevation Church. Um, so think of people who are happily connected to their own church somewhere else. 
um, but they enjoy watching Pastor Stephen's sermons or they like to follow his social media because it's encouraging, something like that. Um, so they're going to engage more specifically with his sermon content, or he just released a book and be really interested in his book content and all of that. Whereas the church, and he's going to occasionally mention church things that are connected to that as well, but he recognizes that his audience is larger than that. Uh, his audience, he's not always trying to get people to come to our church because he's also ministering to people who are already connected in other places. Uh, but for Elevation Church, we're trying to show people how, hey, you want to talk about this sermon? You can join a small group during the week. And that's not necessarily something that that's better coming from the church voice than from Pastor Stephen's voice. I, th I think one thing I'd like to de demystify for everyone listening is I think it's probably easy to listen to what Nikki's describing and say, hey, big words, our church is international. Mm -hmm. We are reaching this many people. We have you know millions in our audience and perhaps mistakenly think that having a, a brand voice or a brand guide or a voice guide that you can share with people on staff isn't maybe necessary for, for your church. You know, one of the things that we hear all the time, Nikki, is like, hey, man, I was doing an announcement and then the children's pastor got up and they, they did not stick to like the idea that we talked about in staff meeting. And so I, I would love to hear from you, how do you cast vision from like a language side. Those three C's are excellent. How do you get a church of your size to stay on message? Because I'm sure if you can describe how you do it, we can apply that in a church of any size. Yeah. Um, I think maybe we're going to talk about this later, but, uh, and there are a lot of different ways. There are some things that we have. So we have a style guide, like this is the way we do dates and times, right? Like that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that every church should do that. Um, this is the way that we say our church name. This is this is the way we capitalize these things. Um, this is the way that we say um, someone's um, title on staff. Uh, it, because it should be the same everywhere, whoever says it, right? Um, so wherever we put 9.30 a.m., it should look the same way every time. Are we uppercase, lowercase? Do we use the periods? Do we not use the periods, right? <laughs> um, it should always be the same. And so so on one hand, we have a style guide that's everyone across the church, this is how we communicate like this. Whether it's in an email or social media, this is the way we say these things. Separate from that, um, when we talk about specific things, like we're about to, I just got out of a meeting for Easter, right? And so when we talk about Easter, how are we going to talk about that? Um, how are we going to say that church-wide? What are, what, are what are the things we're going to put around that? And so, so we create a guide for everyone to use. Um, in, uh, we call those language guides. And, and they're so helpful because um, you, you create this resource and you get it in the hands of everyone who will be communicating. And then they have parameters to stay in for that. Nikki, this is this conversation is already so fascinating because uh, to a lot of the folks listening, I'm sure the idea of a style guide is really familiar, and that's a, most often a, a visual element. How do we want these things to look? How do we how do we type 9:30 a.m. right with the periods or without? Uh, but talking about a language guide, it's it's really fascinating and and really appropriate. I'm 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 confident that a lot of us who work in church are thinking like, oh yeah, I wish that everyone on staff or all the volunteers would talk about this thing that we really want to talk about the way that we want to talk about it. And so I, I want to talk a little bit more about your language guides in a few in a few moments, but I want to just take one step back and just hear a little bit, a little bit from you. Like you're talking about how you instill this language once you have it, but I'm curious, how do you mind this language out in the first place? Like how do you discern what Elevation Church Voice is at all? Well, I mean, I didn't decide that. That was decided before I came <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Um uh, but I, I think um, I think that we're careful to. So our church just celebrated our 18th anniversary, right? Mm. And and so the the way that we say things that we said things 18 years ago, and the way that we say them now, like what we might call casual 18 years ago, and what we call casual now, I just think you have to always be kind of like uh, self policing that. Um, like, hey, this is getting this language is getting tired. I know this mm. is like this sounds like us, but. And so I think there has to be someone who owns it. And again, this works for a small church, right? Who on your staff is good at writing? <laughs> mm. That's really all it is. Uh, there's probably someone who's better at it than everyone else. Um, and and so, so give them the reins on it and then, and then get the... And then get the important voices in the room, right? So then you've got you've got your pastor, you know, uh, your your area directors, whatever it is, um, and say like, hey, what do you guys think about this? How does this resonate with you? And 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 then if you can have a person who's leading it, and you choose 
of the person who's deciding on it, who's making the decision, and then you get the key influencers in the room, you can hash it out and land on some things that you all feel good about. And then if everyone agrees on the direction, um, then you've really got something unifying there. A couple of weeks ago, we were talking with uh, Transformation Church, and they used similar language. They said, uh, the guy we were talking to said, look, there always has to be a hater in the room, someone that can say, <laughs> you know, and, and, and you're, you, you use the word policing. So I'd really like for you, if you would, to put on your kind of Sergeant Shearer uh, nice. cap, cap for us. Can you tell us about like an actual time, the more granular, the better, where you're like, hey, this is the language we used. Here's why it doesn't align with what mm. we wanted, and here's what we need to change it to instead. Because I think this can get a bit esoteric for people that maybe, unlike you and myself, who like live in copywriting day in, day out. So the more like practical, I think it helped land the plane a bit for folks. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so this is my job. I I do it every single day. <laughs> so uh, a lot of a lot of what I do is uh, give feedback on copy that I see come through. Right. So uh, someone <laughs> might feedback. Feed, feedback. <laughs> And so, uh, but this is that policing, right? Is that I get to be the person who um, who watches out for our voice in the sense we've got an email going out to thousands of people, right? And 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 when I see the copy for it, uh, there might be something in there that's it's not clear. Um, you know, like this, the communication feels a little bit muddy or something like that, or or it's uh, it's coming across too formal, which is not Elevation Church voice is not formal. We're casual. Um, and that's really important to us. And so, uh, so whatever it is, the specific thing, then I will, I will comment with the, um, I try really hard not to ever say like, Hey, this doesn't sound like us without saying why it doesn't sound like us. So that's like the really important thing. And when you've got like those, those, um, those kind of guides, those values lining you, lining you up for like, Hey, we all agreed on, this is what we sound like. Mm -hmm. And so when I read this, my perspective is that it's not clear. Uh, this feels confusing to me. Can we make this clearer? And so I, I think like just being able to point again, right back to those, this is what we said our voice is. And so to me, and maybe to you, this is clear, but it's not to me. And so it should be clear to all of us, to anyone who looks at this. So let's, let's rework it again to make it clear. Is that, is that yeah. how, does that answer the question? Yeah, and you really answered the question when you shared those three, exactly. you know, concise, casual, and conversational, because, it, it, you know, it's it's so funny. Usually the larger churches have a really good grasp on this, because by necessity, if you don't have a grasp on values that are clearly cast in the form of vision, chaos reigns supreme, yeah, right? Yeah. And, in, and in smaller churches, we can sometimes get away with that, because like, hey, it's a small church family, of course it's chaos, you know, yeah. it's like a regular family, it's yeah. just wild. But yeah. like, the larger you get, you have multiple departments, multiple heads, you got these people reporting to these people, reporting to these people, you have to have these values lined up. That being said, I think for every size church, this is so important. What do we talk about all the time? The challenge when you're working with creatives, and this is creative writing, but Sharing a sermon is creative. Mm -hmm. Worship is creative. So much of what we do in church is storytelling and creative. How do you give feedback? How are you critical? How do you tell someone, okay, this needs to be changed? And it sounds like maybe a big, big part of your job is finding ways to give that critical feedback, but it not being hurtful or offensive, and it's still achieving the end objective that you want. Could you talk maybe about, like, what are some of the biggest challenges that you encounter and have to continually overcome when... You're talking about giving that feedback. Yeah. Um, and I know like people don't really love the word feedback. I don't have a better word for it though. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, um, uh, so the first thing I would say is that, especially for my copywriting team, uh, we have values uh, for our team. And um, and one of them is that we're flexible. Um, and I kind of have in the description underneath that, like, don't like our first draft, want us to take another shot? We'd love to. Uh, we can't wait to make this better. And and I think when you come in, like when I interview someone, I, I start right at the gate. Like, how would it feel for you to um, have to rework every single thing that you have that you write for us forever? <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> there's never gonna be a point when someone's not saying, like, hey, can we try it this way? Hey, can we do that instead? There's ne you're never gonna like outgrow the season because we always wanna get better. Uh, we always want to, we're we're eager to hear what someone else's view viewpoint is on what we wrote. And so, so there's never, I think when you can kind of demystify the, like, I think we like to think, well, I just need feedback for a little while and then I'll get good enough and I won't need it anymore. Right. 
Um, well, then if, if no one's dialoguing with you about your art, your creativity, your, your talent, whatever it is, if you don't have someone dialoguing with you about it, it's probably not getting better um, because you're not getting an outside voice on it. And so I, so just, I would say we set the expectation from the beginning. Like, that's how we do it. Uh, we, we always have someone else look at things, at least one other person. Many things have more than that. Um, so we've got someone looking like purely from like, oh, that grammar is not correct. And then someone else looking from the like, oh, that's not, uh, we need to add this information. That information is missing. And, and, and so when you've got like these different voices in there, um, uh, and you set that expectation when people are expecting that, then it's not, it's not hurtful, right? It's not like you don't take it as personal. Like this is just part of the job. This is the way we do this. Like if I worked for a newspaper, every single thing I wrote would be copy edited. Yeah. You know, Nikki, we sat down to, to chat with you about, you know, language guides and, and our conversation has quickly just kind of evolved into just general leadership in church, which I mean, for so many people listening to the show, like these are the things we're working through, how to lead teams. And, and right now we're talking about um, policies for language, which I mean, you've done such a good job of articulating how to give feedback in that space. And it's what we talk about on the show too, about having policies for social media, for example, and how to make decisions about what to post and what not to post. Well, we hold it up against the policy. We've agreed on these things. And so we get to hold it up against that. For, for your case in the, in the language department, you have this policy. We are, we're casual, we're concise, we're conversational. And so when you're giving feedback, you get to hold it up against that and say, you know what, this is not clear enough. This is not concise enough. Um, I do want to talk about I want to transition now a little bit into your social media policies um, and some of the decisions that you make in and amongst your team. Um, you know, we we have conversations with people on the show all this uh, all the time. Social media managers, folks who are posting for their churches, and and we we usually get to the point of the conversation talking about like how do you decide what to post and what not to post. And in America and a, a church of your influence and your affluence, like something you, you surely run into a lot is like when there is a national tragedy, for example, like how do we decide what to post, what not to post. Folks are looking to elevation for spiritual direction. What does what does God say about this? What does our what does the what do the Christians say about this? And you're one of the churches that folks are looking to. And so I guess, I guess that's my question is like, how are you making decisions about what to post and what not to post um, when a situation like that, whether national or otherwise, is kind of unfolding? Mm. Um, I'll, I'm going to answer this really practically and specifically for you. But the first thing I'm going to say is like, you're not going to get it right every time. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, you seek wise counsel and you pray about it and you make the best call. That's, that's what you do. Um, but, but here's how we decide. Um, uh, and I will say like, we haven't always gotten it right. Um, there have been times where we are like, eh, we should have posted about that sooner or mm. that we shouldn't have posted about that one. We've, we've self-reflected a couple of times like that. Um, but in general, um, we are going to make, uh, comments that are connected to our values, what matters to us, things like, um, or here's, here's, I'll be really practical. We have um, like physical locations as well as an online ministry. And so say um, there's a tragedy. Um, I personally live uh, near our Roanoke, Virginia campus. So say uh, something terrible happens in the Roanoke, Virginia area. Our church is going to make a statement about that. Uh, mm -hmm. We're gonna we're gonna say something that's gonna comfort specifically the people who are connected to our ministry from that area. That matters to us. We've got people there. We minister to people there. That's specific to us. Um, as opposed to if the same exact thing happened in another area where we don't have like an established ministry, maybe we haven't met people in that city before in person or something like that, then we're less likely to say a comment about that. For instance. We also have like core core values um, related like to our outreach specifically. And so like for some church that would look like missions, right? Maybe you've got like a mission presence in like a certain area that your church is just like really connected to. And for us, we've got like certain certain ministry partners that we partner with. And and so uh, what that that partners sorry, that partnership also um, comes out in like how we speak about things. And so mm. um so it really is, it's personal, right? So personal is powerful. Um, we're, the one thing that we are pretty committed to is we're not going to say something just to say something. So uh, I'm not going to do pray, hashtag pray for whatever. Um, we kind of committed like we're not going to do that kind of post anymore. If we're going to do that, we're actually going to write the prayer. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not just going to like try to do like the cool trendy thing. I want to do something that gives people value or uh or helps them, comforts them, gives them something like that a church needs to give them. Right, so that's, I mean, you mentioned 
reflecting on ways that you've missed before in the past, my sense is maybe you've reflected and be like, hey, you know, we kind of just did like the token post there. And next time, let's do something that's a bit more substantive because we don't want to simply do something because, oh, everyone else is. And by us not doing it, there's almost like the sin of omission of mm -hmm. us like opting out of it. So if we are, we're going to make it substantive. Is, is that accurate? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Okay. It's funny because uh, we've never spoken. And I don't know about, you know, elevation specific policy on this, but uh, this is identically what we have shared for years mm -hmm. um, in response to people asking us, this happened, should we say it? We've always had two simple principles. One, does it align with your church's existing ministries specifically. So like if there's something to do with like, you know, um, young mothers, uh, oh, it's, it's abortion, it's something like that. And you have like a huge emphasis at your church in your ministries already, great. Or is it local? Mm -hmm. If it's local, then great. If it's neither of those two things, you have like the freedom to just opt out because it doesn't actually align with your existing ministry. And so if anything, it could kind of look like you're, you know, a front runner and wanting to jump on the trend just to, you know, virtue signal. Let's uh, talk about special initiatives. Um, you are in the middle of book season with yes. Pastor Stephen. Yes, uh, we've been it is the middle. Six months. <laughs> okay, there you go. Yeah. Do you feel like you're coming out of it? Are we getting close to that? Is the a little bit, yeah. Uh, it's also Easter season. You know, you mentioned just coming out of an Easter meeting. Uh, Easter's a bit earlier this year, uh, but by the time this goes out, it is still pre-Easter. I'd love to hear about like, what are you specifically tackling for Easter right now? Like, okay, this is going to be a bigger service for most churches. What are some of the things that you have to get your, you know, ducks in a row, as it were, in respect to Easter? Um, for us, the most important thing on Easter is inviting people to church. Um, it is, uh, it's the Sunday for us that we have one of the highest attendance. People tend to come to Easter more than Christmas. Um, and so it's the, it's, it, and I think a lot of that is, uh, location specific. Uh, so for instance, uh, how people are going to come in the Southern United States as opposed to Canada, uh, that will probably be different. Right. And so, so you have to apply this to your, to your own scenario, but, um, but for us, we know that we tend to see people um, more easily come to church on Easter. And so knowing that, uh, we try to capitalize on the opportunity. Um, the mission of Elevation Church, we exist so that people far from God will be raised to life in Christ. That's our mission. And, and so when I think about Easter and I think about the mission of reaching people far from God um, and, and, and what Jesus— like. Uh, Easter and Christmas are the only two Sundays of the year that are actually wrapped around a particular passage in the Bible, right? A lot of, most of our other Sundays are whatever the pastor wants to preach on, you know, any particular thing or whatever. But but Easter and Christmas are both around particular biblical events. And so this particular biblical event of Easter is tied directly to our mission. Um, and so, so that's so important to us. And so when I think about how I'm going to talk about Easter, I'm thinking about talking to people far from God. Um, so, because that's the thing that matters most to us. And so, uh, so just to like give you just like a teeny bit of a glimpse, I'm talking all the way from people who have been in our church for years and I want them to invite people to church all the way to people who've never heard of our church before and trying to get them to come to church, right? People who are unchurched, you might say. And so how do I talk to those two people are really different. Um, but I'm putting a lot of my focus energy, time, resources toward what I would call the cold audience as people far from God. And so I'm not going to say the word Calvary. I'm not going to say the word resurrection. I'm not going to say the blood of Jesus, uh, right? Um, I'm not going to say any of these words that make someone feel like an outsider. This is really important, um, a, a, an important guiding principle for how we develop language is um, anyone can be a part of our church. It might not be for everyone. Everyone might not like it, but anyone can come. Um, you don't have to understand what we're, you know, any fancy language. There's not any prerequisite to be able to come here. And so, so when we're thinking about such a like steeped in tradition holiday, like Easter, and how we talk to someone who is not steeped in that tradition and how we get them to connect to it and come to it, that's really important to us. That's such good insight because I think a lot of us know this anecdotally that when we're trying to communicate about whether it's Easter or anything else we're doing at church, that's where we get bogged down a little bit is in the mess messy middle because we all know, regardless of the size of our church, that we're talking to two 
distinct groups of people, folks who are either plugged in at church, know the language, know the lingo, attend every Sunday, and folks who don't come to church, maybe who've never heard the language or the lingo, but we want them to come to church on Sunday. And so it sounds like maybe what you're describing is that you are creating different content pieces for these two different groups of people. Is that true? And if it is, can you give me an example of, um, you know, one of each piece of, of content, but for the same event? Mm. Mm. You, boy, you're, you're, you're playing with my memory here because I don't have it up in front of me. But I can <laughs> give okay. you, okay. Um, <laughs> that's okay. I can give you, I can give you a little bit here. Um, so uh, here's, here's a good example. Um, we were using um, the verse... And boy, you're really testing my memory here. I think it's John 16, 33, but it doesn't matter. The one that says, um, in this world, uh, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world, mm -hmm. right? That verse. Um, and, and we really love that for Easter because um, it has this tension in it of like, there's going to be trouble, but everything's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And the reason everything's going to be okay is because of Jesus. And and so we can we can take that that tension that we're talking about. And we can talk to our warm audience. Um, and so I'm going to talk to them uh, from stage on Sunday, right? If they're in the room, then they're a warm audience. Um, right. I'm going to talk to them in people whose emails I've already gathered. Um, they've already engaged with us in some manner. I'm going to talk to them from that, that warmer um, angle where I'm going to talk to them about, hey, there's someone in your life who's going through a hard time right now. Uh, there's someone in your life who needs the hope of Christ, um, and they need to know that even though they're going through a hard time, everything's going to be okay. Who are you inviting to Easter? That's how I'm going to say that to my warm audience. But to my cold audience, which is like uh, uh, ads, is a great spot for this. But also, like again, I love thinking of small church context because I've been in a small church before too. Um, I had church experience before Elevation, and. And so maybe to you, this is like a social media post that you boost a little bit, right? It's just like a small thing. But if you do that, it's going to hit some people who aren't familiar with your church, and that's going to be a cold audience. And so for them, that's going to be more like, uh, life is hard right now, but there's hope. Um, come find out why. Join us for Easter at Elevation. Um, and that's like maybe a little cheesier than I'd actually write it, but, <laughs> but off the cuff, that's it. On the spot, yeah, on the yeah, spot. Yeah, that's good enough. That gives you, but that gives you kind of like the difference, right? Where I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm basing it in scripture. I'm pulling out like what we call like a felt need or attention. And then I'm thinking about how does that matter to the person who's already coming to church and what action step do I want them to take? I want them to come and invite somebody. How does that matter to somebody who doesn't come to church? Why would they even want to come? Um, and, and so kind of thinking about that both ways. So you talked about the importance of making this big push for invitation at Easter. Bigger than Christmas, there's the existing willingness for folks to come, maybe region specific. I'm confident that a big part of making those invites is empowering people in the existing church to make those invites themselves personally. So are you like resourcing folks with like, hey, when you invite them, talk about it like this? All over the place. <laughs> what does that actually look like? Are you like handing out pamphlets? Yeah, like, tracks, is like, is yeah. it? <laughs> yes. I mean, we've done this so many ways. So one thing that we do at all of our campuses is uh, uh, Elevation Church is heavily volunteer led. Um, our our staff at campuses is low. Uh, there there be like maybe four to ten camp staff members on a campus, and so the rest of it is all volunteers and leaders and. Um, and so we have a volunteer rally every Sunday. And that's a really um, important moment of investment on our campus. Um, it will be right before we're expecting guests to arrive. Uh, most campuses, it's 45 minutes before church. And we have this little, this touch base, about 15 minutes. And that right there is a really important spot where we mobilize people with information, with assets, with uh, how to's, with uh, we'll have fun with it. Uh, you know, can our children's ministry or our guest experience team invite the most people to church? Let's see how, you know, we'll track it. We have, we have a great time with it. Or so we have fun with it. We'll make it really spiritual. Uh, everyone write down the first name of the person that you're inviting to church this Sunday. We're going to pray over them together right now. Um, uh, partner up with the person next to you. Uh, share the name, first name of the person you're inviting this week. Pray over each other. So, so in our in a really intimate setting with among our volunteers, that's more what it looks like. But from stage, uh, when you're when you're communicating to the whole congregation, that looks like, hey, on your way out today, we're going to give you five invites to Easter. 
and we want you to hand these out to five people this week. For sure, you know five people that don't go to church anywhere that you think might come. Why not? Hand them an invite. Put it, you know, put it under their windshield wiper, whatever it is. Uh, we'll give them ideas. But, but just to kind of give you like the contrast there of how we would communicate that in different ways. But we really try very hard um, to put resources in people's hands. So uh, just like usually they're like little square invites or something like that. Um, sometimes they're clever. Sometimes they're just really like clear but beautifully designed. Um, we change them up. But yeah, it's a, that's a pretty big thing for us. Okay, I got to ask, it really stood out to me when you were describing language for invitation. And I think it's really important here to distinguish what Nikki's describing as the starting point for folks and then where you eventually get led to when you actually attend church and how those are very, very different. The starting point is not the end point. But you said one word we're not going to use in talking about Easter to folks that don't know anything about church is the word resurrection. I think saying we plead the blood of Christ over you. I think it's understandable why we might not use that language, <laughs> uh, yeah. but it's so common in church to be like, you know what's next week? Resurrection Sunday. Mm -hmm. We often retitle Easter to put that directly into the name. So can you talk about like the decision for why not to use something uh, like that for someone that might be like, wait a minute, why can't we use that? Mm -hmm. uh, so just to like be clear, we'll use that in church. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll hear Pastor Steven say that. You'll hear our host say that from stage uh, where we're not using that is outside. Um, so, uh, and that's because uh, resurrection is not an everyday conversation. If you talk to someone who doesn't know Christ, they are never going to say the word resurrection. That it, it's just not like, it's just not going to be, it's not a word that's in normal language. And so I, instead of saying, but they do know what Easter is, they do know Easter Sunday. And so, uh, so we don't Christianize it in the, in the language to people who are far from God. Um, I'd rather say um, Jesus was raised to life. I'd rather say that. Jesus came back to life again after dying for us. I'd rather say that. Um, it's clear. You, it's weird. What? How did that happen? But still, like, you get what I'm saying. Yeah, and I love the way that you've talked about, hey, here's how we're going to talk about with folks that are familiar with the language, and here's how we're not going to talk about it. So there's a source scripture, and that source scripture inspires two different expressions of the language. So for instance, you could say to someone that is not going to ever use the word resurrection, like, hey, we're bringing hope out of hopelessness. Well, what is that? That's resurrection. You take something that's dead, and you're bringing it back to life, but it's an accessible language that someone that doesn't have any like experience with, like, wait, 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 what does resurrection mean? It's the same meaning to them, and you can meet them where they're at. And then it sounds like, hey, once we're in church, that's the whole point. Now we're going to lead them to where we want them to be. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's talk about ads. You mentioned uh, doing ads copy. I'd love to know, what are the advertising or outreach platforms that Elevation's seeing the most traction with right now? Well, I can't speak into that a lot um, because I'm not behind the strategy of it. Um, but we have, we have all like the, the basic spots that we certainly are very present on, uh, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, we're having fun experimenting on TikTok still. <laughs> that's, that's still like a growing space. We experiment with it. I don't think that's for everyone. And I don't think it's for every church. Um, but I do think <laughs> that Facebook and Instagram are for every church still. Um, those, uh, you should be on there. Um, but then uh, outside of that, it depends on what it is that we're advertising. Uh, so we'll advertise on Spotify because we have Elevation Worship, of course. Um, and we'll, yeah. Uh, and then it's really like um, we'll advertise on Amazon. Uh, Pastor just released his book. So again, advertising for that's in different places. It really just depends on like what we're talking about. But I would say uh, uh, Google and Google, Facebook, Instagram are probably like our main spots. Easy. Okay, let's talk about the copy then specifically. Uh, what I, I'd love to hear, like you've presumably been a big part of overseeing or directly writing a lot of different ad copy. Uh, what What are some of your you know your favorites that you've done over the years? Gosh, any winners in your mind that you're like, oh, you know what? I really crushed it. I yeah. I, I was in the lab. I was in my bag, this, and we this just one got so many people saved. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> I. I can't, I can't recite for you something that I feel that way about, but I will tell you the ones that I feel most proud of uh, have been fun. Um, yeah, I think people, um, and not like, so one of the ways, uh, we have even more specific ways to 
when I teach Elevation Church Voice, I teach there is a lot more to it. And one of the things I say is that we are fun but not silly. And I think that's like an important distinction as well. Um, our culture is fun. It's important to us that people can be lighthearted. Um, uh, life is heavy. And so it doesn't always have to be heavy. We can have fun. Um, and uh, there, I remember um, there there've been a, an Easter one and a Christmas one that we've done with kids in them. And kids are easy. People love kids. And we use staff kids. That keeps us safe. <laughs> um, nice. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Uh, but um, uh, kids are endearing. It's hard not to smile at kids, not to be like, oh, look at that. I'm going to lean in a little more. Uh, that doesn't feel like so serious. I don't feel like I'm going to feel judged by that, right? Um, it's very approachable. And I think advertising needs to be approachable. So that would be a good example, I suppose, of fun, but not silly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I feel like if it was me, that's an important, you would need to teach that to me, Nick. Like, hey, Braid, yeah. Yeah. fun, not silly, because I feel like it would descend well, into- a little blurry there. Oh, that's, that's pretty juvenile there, son. I, I got there pretty quickly. We, we have this line that we use for it, because we have some particular staff members who cross that line. And, and, uh, <laughs> and we say, uh, well, you don't know the line until you cross it. <laughs> and there's some of them that cross it more than <laughs> Okay, then th th this was not planned, but I got to ask this. You know, one of the Elevation Church posts that came across my feed this year, and frankly, I've talked about it, I was a big fan of it, supportive of it, uh, feels like it might have crossed into the silly territory, <laughs> and that was the uh, SpongeBob karaoke cover of one of the Hillsong worship songs. I, did that one slip through there, Nikki, or what happened? <laughs> I need to know who posted that one. It was. It, it, I feel like it was probably our youth account or th our worship. It, it was. Yes. Yeah. It would have so been on the on the on the youth account. They're allowed to be silly. They're allowed yeah. to be silly. Yeah. The youth account is very. They go rogue a little bit. So you can see it in her eyes. <laughs> she looked to the side. She's like the youth account. Uh, every single senior leader yeah. listening knows that feeling. What did the youth group do yeah, this time? They those, did what? Those youths. Yeah. And so, but just like very candidly, you gotta let them a little bit. Um, uh, their their demographic is different than the whole church. It's very zeroed in. Certainly. And um and so I don't want to post that, and I don't want our church account to post that. Um and I will call them out if they spell something wrong. But other than that, <laughs> <laughs> um, other than that, um uh, they can have fun with it because um teenagers need to be able. And my I have a teenager. I'm a mom. Um, and teenagers need to be able to find church approachable too. And so just like a little aside there, go ahead and let your youth ministry set up their own account, keep eyes on it, keep them in the guard guardrails, but like theirs can be wider than yours. You know, Nikki, you just, you just use the word demographic there to give, to give your youth account a little bit more license to be maybe a little bit more silly. And that seems to be the common thread that has been just like quietly weaved throughout this entire conversation is that in just about everything you've said, you have revealed that the decisions that you're making, whether it's on social or with the Elevation Church Voice, whatever it is, are informed by the people you're talking to and by having a, a really acute awareness of who you're talking to and why you're talking to, to them. And to me, as a pastor, that's like, that feels very pastoral in nature, that like, you know the people you are talking to or that you want to talk to. They are known and you are addressing them in a way that's appropriate for them, in a way that's attractive to them. And so I just want to ask you, like in your role, um, I, I forget what your actual uh, what your actual job title is, but in your role, like, does it feel like the work that you're doing is pastoral in nature? Absolutely. I um uh it's very I feel like I feel like I have a very pastoral role um because I get to have um I get to have this really zoomed out view um, of people and to try to notice um, what I'm seeing the different de demographics leaning into and needing and that kind of a thing. And, um, and, and I, I think a lot of times in ministry, so I have been in the past, uh, we were, we were at a previous small church in Vermont, a little closer to you guys. And, um, and I was in, uh, more pastoral, what we would call classically pastoral ministry there. And um, and I think uh, a beautiful thing that's happened in churches is uh, that we've really like expanded uh, what ministry can look like. 
and in the different ways that God can use different people's um, gifts, talents, experience, um, perspective to to really fill a need that someone else, maybe you have a senior pastor who's great at communicating from stage, but he's not good at writ- written communication, right? Uh, imagine someone partnering with him um, to learn to write in the voice that he speaks in um, to help him translate that um, in other spaces in written form. Like what a beautiful ministry. Um, I wrote down, I actually wrote down some questions. I had a feeling you were going to ask me this um, because I feel like this would be helpful to your listeners. I have some questions that help me decide um, uh, what I'm going to say and how I'm going to say it. Mm. Outstanding. Let's do it. Okay. I have, it's just four questions. They're not, they're not hard. Who am I speaking to? Um, that's, that's where I start. And so is it a small group of people, a large group of people? Um, are, is, is there a particular age demographic about them? Uh, do they live in a certain place? Um, is it very broad? Is it very narrow? Just really try to like think about that. Um, and then what do I want them to hear? Um, and this is very different from what do I want to say? Um, because what I want to say and what they might hear might be two different things. I might need to say it in a different way than I want to say it in order for them to hear it the, <clears throat> the way that I want them to hear it. And so what do I want them to hear? Excuse me. And then um, what do I want them to do? Uh, so there should be some kind of call to action, right? Um, do I want them to come to Easter? Do I want them to pray for something? But I should be clear. I should be clear in who I'm speaking to, what I want them to hear and what I want them to do. And then how do I want them to feel? Um, because imagine if I'm super clear in all of that, but it's like so direct that it's off-putting, mm. right? Yeah, so how do I want them to feel when they when they engage with my content? Okay, I have an extremely practical example of what she just said that I did today. And the reason I'm bringing up my experience is because, yes, we share a last name, but when Nikki said that she cared how AM and PM were stylized, I knew <laughs> that we were kindred spirits. <laughs> I was like, okay, it's not just the last name. So today we had a church upload a sermon file late to us. So for context, Nikki, we prepare uh, social media content for churches. That's one of the services that we, we, we do. So we need sermons to be uploaded by Tuesday at midnight. And this sermon came in late. And it's really tough for us to turn it around when it comes in late. And so what we've done is we've implemented this hard deadline. Most churches get it to us on Sunday. I say, if it doesn't come in before uh, Tuesday, Midnight Pacific, we can't get get it done. So we had this pre-written email to re- reply to this church, and one of our editors sent it to them. And the church uh, did not care for this email, mm. and they replied like, "Hey, are you serious? Like, this is the first time this has happened. Like, are we going to get a refund? Like, come on." And my editor was like, "I thought like we communicated clearly this deadline. Like, why are they like getting?" emotional about this. And I said, well, I think it might be the copy. Uh, because w- what they said was, and I quote, it was, it was, we will not prepare this sermon for you because it is after our deadline. Mm. And I said, when you communicate it as we will not, mm. there's agency in your decision. Mm-hmm. You are the judge and jury and have said, look, I could do this, but I'm not gonna. <laughs> and I said, we need to change this script to say we are unable to yeah. complete sermons. I said, because now we've removed the agency. It's not that we don't want to, we'd love to. It's just that there are very real deadlines and there's simply not enough time in the day. So we, 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 we physically literally cannot. And I said, if we don't change this, every time we send this email out, it's gonna put the church on their back foot immediately because how we're making them feel is we're very corporate, we're very direct, and we're very like, we will not do this, so tough luck. Um, so hopefully that serves as a practical example for uh, maybe, you know, in terms of how. I, I actually think this applies to feedback too. Um, you can be clear and kind. Mm. I think um, a lot of times uh, in an effort to be clear, um, we end up being harsh. And I'm like, well, that's just how it is. And, you know. Mm. Uh, Sorry, I speak the truth. I speak yeah, the truth. That's, yes. Yeah, that's it. Um, and you don't need to be that way, especially because you have access to AI. So if, say, you're a person who just is not a nice communicator, you can put it into AI and say, make this nicer. Make this more quickly. <laughs> <That's> so good. <laughs> There's no excuse. Yeah. AI discipling us to be more like Jesus in the way we I talk. Mean, <laughs> well, yes. it is one of the benefits <laughs> yeah. of working remotely. You don't have to talk to someone yes. face-to-face. S- hear what they have to say before you slack them back. <laughs> yes. Seek the Lord, then seek AI, 
And that way, and, and that can teach you. You're like, oh, okay, so that's how you'd say yeah, it, that's you know? And look, it. those are those language models have been trained by, you know, hundreds of millions right. of inputs. Of kind and so people, yeah. presumably the kind people have told <laughs> yeah. the AI how to talk. We're not yet kind, we're learning. I yeah. love it. Yes, please deliver this feedback in the voice of Fred Rogers. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you you love Mr. Rogers. I love Mr. Rogers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Canada, we had Mr. Dress Up. Oh, that's, that's interesting. True. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like the knockoff. We have a lot of knockoff <laughs> yes. things where it's like, you know, this is what they do, and then this is what you know. Yeah. You have the NFL. We have the CFL, the Canadian Football League. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Just lower budgets generally. Yeah. Yeah. That, lower that, viewership. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> Uh, this has been an outstanding conversation, Nikki. Very grateful for your time, especially during a busy Easter season where you're surely uh, overseeing many responsibilities. Is there anything, uh, you know, parting words of wisdom that you'd like to leave for many of the churches listening uh, that, uh, you know, are in different situations, smaller situations, but I think so many of uh, the things that we've talked about are truly uh, universal. Mm. I just think that for every ministry, regardless of the size, if you know what you're trying to do and who you're trying to do it for, and you can clearly define the way that you want to do that. You don't need a lot of people to do that, um, but you can have uh, one of the phrases that we use is focus excellence. It's really important to us. Um, And you can do that. Uh, You don't need a lot of people to do that. You don't need a lot of resources. I recommend um, getting Grammarly uh, I recommend uh, using AI. Uh, don't these things are not? I use them. I'm a professional. I have a copywriting team. I use them, hmm. um, and so uh, use the tools at your disposal. Don't make things hard on yourself. Um, and uh, and I don't know. Let's go like win more people for Christ. There you go. Yeah, praise God. Anything uh, that you wish to plug, uh, either on your own behalf or on behalf of the church? I mean, if you haven't gotten Pastor Stevens' new book, Do the New You, you're out of your mind. <laughs> I um I got to read it way ahead of time. Um, it's excellent. It's helpful. It's practical. Um, and I'm just excited for everybody to get their hands on it. Also, the plug I'll give you is the audiobook is re- is read by him and it has bonus content on it. Is this the first time that he's done the uh, audiobook? I don't know. It might be. It's uh, this is the first book he's released in eight years. So all of his mm. previous books uh, were were eight years or older. Wow. I am an uh, audiobook listener almost exclusively, and it is always a huge benefit when I know that I'm yeah. listening to the author. You can just like feel the you know hours and hours of work that they've poured into the material, and it kind of just like comes out into the uh, performance of the the reading of the audiobook. So that's great to hear. You can find that on Audible. Find the book anywhere where books are sold, online or in person. And uh, thank you to Nikki. Thanks as always to everyone for their time, attention, and trust. And we'll talk to you real soon. We're watching. Trust? No, I don't know what that is. Really? Did you just make something up? Nope. It's another reality game show. <laughs> it's like... Does uh, it involve trust? Yeah.